I didn't always think that mathematics and responsible citizenship were really tightly connected. And that changed for me. That changed for me back in 2008. That was the election between Barack Obama and the late John McCain. And it was one of, during one of their debates that McCain said something like this. He said, what Senator Obama is not telling you is that under his tax plan, half of all small business profits will be taxed at a higher rate. He went on to talk about how that would be bad for the economy, bad for jobs. And a few minutes later, Obama came back and he said, the vast majority of small businesses don't make more than $250,000. In fact, 98% of small businesses won't see their taxes go up one cent. If you're like a lot of people, I think in that moment you thought, oh, I kind of trust one of them and the other is just kind of making it up. But if you think through it, if you think more deeply than these, these you know, pithy sound bites, something deeper is going on. And it's possible that they're both telling the truth here. You see, if we think about all these small businesses, you might have a lot of small businesses making very little money. And then occasionally, some small business does really well and makes a lot of money. Some other small business just rakes it in. And if you think through, it might be that if you look at the number of small businesses, a huge portion of them, 98%, are making less than $250,000, but if you're looking at the numbers of dollars, it might be that half of those dollars are going to, to just a few of those small businesses. It might be that both of those statements are true. Now, that's the sort of mathematical thinking you need to do in that moment to understand our national debate, to make an informed choice. And, you know, it's honestly, it's, it's the sort of mathematical thinking I did really quickly. I was kind of proud of myself. Maybe, you may be even a little smug. But the next thought I had really stopped me cold. I thought, that's the thinking you need to do in order to understand our mathematical, di our, our, our national dialogue. I had not once, in more than a decade, taught a single student to do that thinking. I had taught over a thousand students mathematics. This is the math that they needed to be responsible citizens. It's not in our college curriculum. It's not in the K-12 curriculum. You know, Jefferson knew that we needed an informed electorate to sustain our democracy, our dem democratic republic. And part of that is mathematical knowledge. Where are we giving our students the math that they need to be informed citizens? And so I started thinking differently. And I started teaching differently. And I want to give you a sense of what that looks like with a couple of examples. For the first one, imagine you're at a hospital out there, year in report, and there's an administrator up front talking about how great they've done. And the administrator might say, you know, one of our goals is to get people out of the hospital, recuperated in their own homes, and we've done a great job. In fact, 95% of the patients who spent the night last year, they checked out within a week. Great job. And in the back, maybe the nurses are sort of mumbling about them. And finally, one of the nurses stands up and says, I don't see how that's possibly true. We worked on Christmas. We remember all the patients who were in the hospital that day, and 80% of those patients had been there the whole year. What? How is it possible that somehow 95% of the patients are short-term patients, and at the same time, 80% of the patients are long-term residents of the hospital? That seems completely contradictory. But if you start to think about it, these two people are talking about different groups. The administrator is talking about a very large group, everybody who spent the night at the hospital. The nurses are talking about a fairly small group, just the ones who were there on one particular night. If you want to think about how it's possible that both of these are true, imagine a hospital with just 10 beds, where 80% of them, eight of them, are long-term residents. Those last two beds, you could have a lot of people cycling through those last two beds. Even in just two weeks, it's possible that the majority of people who spent the night are in those last two beds. If you extend this over a year, it might be 95% who are cycling through those last two beds in short-term stays. Now, when I talk about this with my students, they think this is just a quirky, strange mathematical example. Until we start talking about how similar statistics hold for people who are getting food stamps for people who are on unemployment, for those who are getting housing vouchers. And if a politician is talking to you and wants you to believe that the people on welfare are on it and they're just leeching off the federal government for years and years, 
They'll cite the statistic at one time, and then a huge portion of those people will be longtime users of those programs. And if a different politician wants you to believe that people are just on welfare for short periods, you know, uh, in between jobs or recovering from an illness, they'll cite the statistic over a year or two or three, and then a huge portion of those people will be short-time users of these programs. Their agenda determines which statistic they serve on. And these sort of statistics are well known in social sciences. This is the stock and the flow. And it's one thing to hear these two numbers and think through, like, oh, they might both be true. But the hard work of being an informed citizen requires that you hear just one of those numbers and imagine what the other one is. That's what it takes to be an informed citizen. These are the sorts of things that I talk with my students about. For the second example, I want you to think back to the financial crisis of a decade ago. Back then, people started talking about inequality a little bit more. And some of their slogans, some of their signs, had fairly complicated statistics in them. They said things like, the top 1% control 30%, 38% of the wealth. Or maybe the bottom 50% 50, 50 earn just 13% of the income. And I don't know about you, but I heard these statistics and I just found them very confusing. It's a couple of different percentages. They're talking about things that I don't think about that much. I don't know how they compare to other people or other countries. And I didn't understand them until I learned a little bit more mathematics. And it's what I share with my students, and I want to share it with you today. To understand this, we have to think about asking the question repeatedly, what percent of the total income of the country do the bottom X percent of people earn? Now, if we're talking about just the bottom, the zero percent, you know, we're going to graph the, the people on the, on the horizontal axis and then the income on the vertical axis. If we're looking at the bottom zero percent, they earn zero percent of the income. And so we're going to put zero comma zero on that graph. If we're looking at the bottom hundred percent, that's everybody. And so we can go ahead and put the point 100, 100. They earn all of the income collectively. And in between, if we know that, say, the bottom 50 percent earn 13 percent of the income, that puts us at the point 50 comma 13. That was actually the, the, the statistic for the U.S. in 2014. Occasionally, when you hear one of these statistics, you have to pause and do a little bit of uh, arithmetic. If we hear that the top 1% earn 20% of the income, we have to do the subtraction and figure out that the bottom 99% earned the rest, 80% of the income. And so 99,80 goes on the graph. Each one of these, each of those statistics is just one point on this graph, but we can draw the entire graph. And if we do, we get what economists call the Lorentz curve. This gives us a much greater, a much fuller picture of what inequality looks like in the United States. But we can go further. We can calculate a single number to measure how equally or unequally something is distributed. And to do that, let's look at the extreme cases. If we all earned exactly the same, this curve would go directly up the diagonal because 70% you know, of the people would earn exactly 70% of the income. The other extreme would be where one person earned all of the income. I guess, I guess that would be Jeff Bezos, right? <laughs> and in that case, none of us would earn anything, and then the curve would go way up at the very end. Lots of income there. Although, I hear he's only going to get half of that in the end. <laughs> if we look at these extreme cases, they form this triangle. And I want to look at the areas. You see, the actual Lorentz curve cuts that into two pieces. And if we shade the area above that curve, we can take the ratio of the yellow region above the curve to the entire triangle. And that is what we call the Gini index. If we look at that ratio in the US in 2014, it was 0.48. To get a sense of how this Gini index can change, in the case of equal distribution of wealth, the curve goes along the diagonal. There's no area above it, and we get a Gini index of zero. And in the Jeff Bezos case, the entire triangle is above the curve. We get a Gini index of one. And so the Gini index goes between zero and one, and it measures the inequality or the equality of a given thing, in this case, earnings, within a society. And I'll tell you what I tell my students. You know, is 0.48 too high, too low? You can bet I have an opinion about that. But that's not my point. I want to give you the tools. I want to give them the tools to better understand inequality to make informed choices, to be informed citizens. And if you're like them, you have a million questions about this. 0.48, how has it changed over time? How does that compare to other countries around the world? 
What if instead of graphing income, we dealt with wealth, the total value of everything you earn? These are fantastic questions, and these are the sort of questions we get into. We talk about lots of other topics in my math class now. We talk about, um, we talk about income taxes, what a marginal tax is. We talk about different voting systems, the pros and cons of each. We talk about this strange system of gerrymandering we have in this country, where politicians are choosing their voters instead of the other way around. All of these topics have fantastic mathematical components, and they help my students be better citizens. And if I had given this talk a couple of years ago, I'd be done now. <laughs> Thanks for listening, you know, go enjoy your lunch. Um, but I've been thinking lately, more deeply, not just about what we're teaching our students, but about how we're teaching them. And I think that how we're teaching them matters, not just at the college level, but way before that, long before that. My daughter's seven, and she and her second grade class are just learning about multiplication. It's a really exciting time, you know? <laughs> at, at least for me. Um, and you know, she works on her homework uh, while I'm doing the dishes, and she might turn to me and say, you know, I'm working on four times six. Is four times six 24? I think that moment has important implications in terms of her future as a citizen. I think that moment, and moments like it, have implications for us, for our democracy. I, I get, that's a bold claim. Let me explain what I mean. <laughs> the last few se years have seen a rise of people believing things that are not true. A rise of people believing lies. Whether it's something a friend posts on, on social media, or something some unscrupulous politician says. People are taking things unquestioning, believing them, and then sharing them. And they go viral. And it's gotten bad enough that it threatens our very democracy. There are a lot of things we don't agree on. I hope we can agree on this. An informed electorate is not one that believes lies. Yeah. What I feel like doing in moments like this is pointing fingers at this politician or that media outlet. But if I'm honest, I'm part of the problem. Math teachers are part of the problem. You see, when we're in front of our classes, when we're teaching, our students are not learning just multiplication or factoring polynomials. They're also building up over years a sense of what it means for something to be true. What makes a fact a fact. What knowledge itself is. Are things true because of you know, decades and, and centuries of, of sifting and winnowing, of figuring things out, of reason and evidence? Or are things true just because somebody in authority tells you that they're true? If I stand in front of my class and I tell them you know, that in a right triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, they might learn the Pythagorean theorem and pass the test at the end. But they're also pushed a little bit in the direction of knowledge as being about authority. And if I'm teaching them to unquestioningly believe what I say, what are they going to do when they're in front of a television screen and two candidates talking about small business taxes tell them two seemingly contradictory things? They're going to believe whoever they see as the authority, whoever they trust more. And maybe that year, your side will get lucky and take the swing states in the election. Or maybe that year, it'll be the other side's turn to win. Either way, the loser will be clear our democracy, which requires people who are willing to stand up, call out what's true and what's not, and demand honest answers from their politicians. And teachers have a role to play in creating that electorate, an informed electorate. Instead of just telling people, about telling our students what the answers are, we can talk about all the processes that came to, that came to make that knowledge. We can put our students in positions where they, they discover the same facts that we have figured out, and they discover them for themselves. They have ownership over that knowledge. They have intellectual autonomy. We can go further. We can turn our classrooms over to our students so that instead of answering our questions, they're asking their own questions, and we can help guide them in that inquiry. Now, I'm far from the first to argue for this sort of student-centered teaching. There are hours of fantastic TED Talks out there about how we should concentrate on the process more than the product, 
how we should turn our classes over to our students, how we should lever their, leverage their creativity. And all of the educational research suggests that our students would be better off if we did that. They would understand things more, they would remember things more. But I think there's a more important implication of that, that they would be better informed citizens. And this can't stop with teachers and math teachers. And that's maybe the most important connection I want to make for you today. This has to involve all of us. This has to involve each one of you. If it's your kid, your grandkid, who asks you, is 4 times 6 equal to 24, what are you going to do? If you just say, yes, excellent work, you're pushing that kid a little bit more in the direction of thinking of knowledge as about authority. You have an opportunity to push them in the other direction. You could say, how'd you get 24? Can you draw me a picture that convinces you that that's right? And when the questions get harder, are you going to be just the answer book? Are you just going to tell them what the answers are? I'll be honest, it feels really good to know the answers and tell them, doesn't it? <laughs> if you do, you're pushing them in that direction. If instead, you can sit next to them and help explore these, these questions with them. Will you do that hard work? And when that hard work, when that work of exploration involves going online, we treat Google like it's some sort of vending machine, just sort of popping out some sort of piece of candy of knowledge. You click on the first link and believe it. Or are you going to do the hard work to question that? Does their reasoning make sense? Do they give evidence? Is that a legitimate website? Does it corroborate what other sources say? That's the hard work we have to do all together. And I'm not arguing that any one of these moments is going to be pivotal for any child. But hundreds and thousands of these moments matter. And if we do it right, it'll add up to questioning citizens who don't just accept what's in front of them, who question the information in front of them, who become an informed electorate. People who are ready to not just be workers or consumers, people who are ready to be active, active participants in our democracy. So I hope you'll join me in treating our students, our children, like the informed citizens we need them to be, both in terms of what we teach and in terms of how we teach it, because the future of our democracy might well depend on it. Thank you.